Thank you everybody so much for joining us uh, here today. Uh, my name is Chris and I am the creative lead here at Mobile Live, but for the next hour and a bit, I also get the pleasure of being your moderator. So why are we all here today? The answer to that question is in fact only two characters long, but boy does it carry a lot of weight, 5G. Now up until this point, it's been a lot of speculation, a lot of anticipation, leaving us alone with our thoughts and ideas to try and imagine that the business models, the experience is what the 5G future will have in store, but no more because 5G is already being deployed globally. And the question isn't what is going to be revolutionized, but when. We have a lot of really exciting ground to cover here today. And uh, I hope as well a brief but lively uh, discussion uh, where everyone gets to get a little bit of involvement into the use cases and what they think or would like to see happen, as well as we'll have a Q&A at the end. Uh, so feel free to drop your questions in as they come to mind using the Q&A function that we have at the bottom, or uh, by all means use the chat as well. Um, so on that note, I will pass it over to our presenter today, uh, my friend and colleague, our uh, Director of Design and Innovation, Uzair. Thank you, Chris. So today's topic is, is very, very exciting. Um, I am so excited about the future and what it brings for us, uh, especially in this time where a lot of uh, uh, worries are on minds of people. So this this would hopefully be a refreshing topic to explore together. Um, I would like to mention here is that 5G is a very detailed topic. Uh, we uh, cannot go through every single thing on 5G in one session, but and I do not intend to do so either. Today's session is meant to be uh, introductory session, or I would call it intermediate session. Uh, hopefully by end of it, you would get a very good understanding of what 5G technology stack is and how is it more important for experience design of future. Um, so with that, let's, let's take a dive in. So before we go into understanding 5G, uh, let's take a ride into future. So let's imagine together we are in 2025. We are five years from now. So this COVID situation has all gone away and we are back to our lives and moving on hopefully, right? Um, so this is 2025. How does the world look like around us? So 5G has been switched on worldwide. Uh, we have around uh, 1 billion or 1.5 billion connections. That is 15% of the global mobile connections that are, are now on 5G. Um, so 15% of global, but it, what's more important is in US, Europe and China, uh, and particularly North America, we would see 30% of the connections to be on 5G. Uh, smart industries, IoT, autonomous transportation, digital healthcare are, are the use cases that are actively using 5G. Um, and then we see in this year 2025 that around 25 billion IoT devices are connected on the network. Um, and overall 1.4 billion um, mobile devices are on the 5G network part. You can see on the side in the honeycomb structure that the emerging use cases are smart home, smart city, connected cars, immersive experiences, and then AR, VR, and gaming. We will cover through most of them in today's session, uh, but this is, this is the world of 2025. And how does computing look like in the world of 2025? Um, so the future is ambient and spatial computing. Uh, hopefully we'll explore that in a bit more detail in today's section, but let's get a glimpse of it. The, the computing of 2025 is very different from what it was in 2020. Uh, the information dimension and the physical dimension are overlapping. And let me show you how. Um, so what it, what it does is it creates lots of use cases for lifestyle, gaming, networking, navigation, task assistance, and medical and healthcare. So this, is 2025. The future is screenless. We don't need a mobile phone anymore in our hand. We can see things in our ambient. We can interact with our smart assistants and we can ask them to project things into our ambient and we can just interact with them and go about with our world. So if you're planning for vacation, you can just see it. You can see the spaces visually, mark them, plan out your activities. If you're if you're cooking, you can see all the recipes in the ambience with you. So computing is ambient. Uh, and this is a theme you will see more and more into the later part of this presentation. 
how do retail experiences look like? So the retail experiences in 2025 are excessively, we are relying more and more into 3D uh, experiences, immersive experiences that are more and more AI powered. So for example, if you have a living room and you're trying to buy some, um, some uh, decorations for it or lamp for it, so AI can scan in your ambience and get to know you better, get to know your style better. You can see here that it picked up on the cushion colors and it gave you many possibilities of the lamp that goes well with it. So uh, it matches your color scheme and you can just go ahead and order it. it makes life easier for you uh, and simpler for you. So, and in terms of the retail experience, your shopping closet, so we always go to retail and we are always trying to do the mental math of what kind of clothes I have and what do I, what can I pair and match with them, right? You don't need to do that in 2025. Your retail and your closet are connected. You have a list of things that you own and what, what other possible clothing choices you can make with them and what looks good on you, what matches your style, what is in and through the market. It will be all an experience-led uh, shopping experience. So we will see more and more of these being adapted. Um, similarly, uh, you any kind of beauty products, you would have all, you don't need to try them on all of them, right? You can just just uh, get the realistic scenario uh, of how they will look on you and what suits your face and what is the best recommended thing uh, product for you. So this would be the kind of experiences. Now, these experiences are not only in your home, you would see them in the stores as well. Um, and then more and more of them will be powered by 5G. What makes me say that? So we know that in-store Wi-Fi hardly ever works, right? And then you go to malls and they have public Wi-Fi access and then you have to sell your identity and lots of tons of information to just sign in to the free Wi-Fi. So privacy will drive people towards using more and more of mobile data. And if it supports in-store experiences, which are more and more ex immersive experiences, that is, that is a very real use case for 5G going forward in terms of retail in physical and also in the digital space. You will get to see more and more of Shopify, Shopee, um, uh, gamified shopping experiences. So shopping won't be that boring anymore. You would just go into the store and see lots and lots of options and uh, you will see real-time deals and discounts. Uh, it would be navigation through AR and VR. Uh, already in 2020, uh, Gartner predicted that 100 million people would be um, browsing and shopping online using AR, VR experiences. So, your home assistant landscape is changing. Then you have smart pets coming up. Uh, they're, uh, they're there to keep you company. Also look around the house, make sure everything is safe and secure, provide you with comfort, particularly for older people, keeps an eye on you in case of any emergency or uh, if you need any companionship or you need, uh, you need some support in the home, they can provide you all that. So different forms, factors that we would see uh, in terms of home robotics. Um, and then the gaming experiences of future are more and more immersive. It's no longer in your head. It's like I said, ambient around you and gamified experiences will change retail. Gamified experiences will change our interactions with the world. So expect more and more of them in 2025. And sports. It's no longer a passive experience. It's more immersive experiences. You get to enjoy all the moments of sports when in full blast of it, full, you're in the middle of it. Either you're joining uh, in the stadium or you're joining remotely. All of them will be connected experiences of future. And then eSports, it's one of the companies which is probably one of the fastest growing companies. And in because of 5G, we will see more and more accelerated gamified experiences around us. Um, we will cover somewhat of it, how the form of this experiences will change in later part of the presentation. But essentially you will see a lot more opportunities of enjoying gaming on the go. More and more crowd content is being generated uh, and uh, no longer content production is the limiting factor because there's tons of content out in the market being produced by influencers, by common day people. It's just more about curating it and monetizing the content. So we'll see more and more shift of business models going forward. Smart habits are something that we would be adopting uh, and we would be living by. So if you wake up at 8 a.m. in the morning, your blinds are already 
uh, already folded, and then you're you're waking up to a, a sweet smell of coffee. Um, all these things that you want to learn, these smart, smart assistants will help you bring all the healthy habits in your life. And on the industrial side, what we see more and more in 2025 is all the control terminals we used to see on our factory floors. And then it would be a coordination between control centers and people on the shop floor. It, it won't be that way. It would be, again, ambient computing, ambient interfaces. You would get to see your work, your schedule, um, all the instructions that you need for fixing that particular machine, for example. Anything that you need to do with your job would be immersive and, and it would simplify the job for you. Uh, in one of the research that we were conducting, one of the great use cases of uh, AR and VR is, is industrial setting. So imagine a factory worker and you have to travel through the factory floor to find certain parts, right? And if the gaming, gaming uh, experience that we saw before in retail is what you see in the Shopify floor, a shop floor, you would immediately get, it would direct you to where you need to be rather than wasting any kind of task. So how does medicine look like? So we know that in 2020 COVID hit and then we saw a lot of adoption of digital healthcare, but 2025 is a game changer. What we are seeing is uh, that people are able to get remote surgeries, especially for places like Canada and other places which are remote and they don't have um, access to this super specialist at all the places. Uh, people would be able to get remote surgeries in tertiary care hospitals or secondary care hospitals where push super specialists is still in the larger city, but they're able to supervise a remote surgery working with the caregivers and their watch. How it will happen, we will see that a bit more in the later part of the presentation, but this is what we are seeing in 2025. Uh, gamified experiences, like I said, would transform the way we interact with the world. So we will see more and more of our interactions with our friends. Gone are the era, gone is the era of Facebook and you just endlessly scrolling it on the phone. It's more like I want to be friends with Chris and hey Chris, let's go and have fun together and I'm on vacation and I can introduce Chris to be part of my vacation. Uh, and he can be there enjoying with me uh, through virtual presence. So what this does for us at workplaces is we don't need to be physically present anymore. All the things that we were craving in 2020 that we cannot do uh, virtually are possible now. We just need the right tools and processes and frameworks in place to make anything happen that we want to at our workplace productivity. So what you are seeing here is also an example of what we call spatial computing. So spatial computing, uh, imagine today's world is we are moving towards immersive experiences, but uh, in spatial computing world, you will see 3D apps. Uh, and what 3D app looks like is, uh, is, is that the experience is on in 3D. This is how 3D experiences look like. So your travel is much more fun. Um, it's, it's like a gamified experience. You are learning more about the history of the place, it's interactive. Um, the whole whole digital experience curated in that application is designed for 3D consumption. It's no longer 2D scroll right, flip. Those gestures are are gone. Now, now you're talking much more depth and breadth of our experience design in terms of digital technologies. So we see one more trend, which is machine to machine communication. So in 2025, your smart fridge is is seamlessly communicating with the grocery provider of your choice. Everything is kind of automated. If you're running low on them, the machine will communicate to the other machines and just place the order. And then they're, they're operating within the operating instructions that you've given them. So for example, my budget is X, Y, Z, and then I have given you a standing instruction of just replenish my milk supply uh, all the time. So you don't need to pause and think that how much you are left with it, it will just be seamless for you. And another dimension of machine-to-machine -machine communication is connected cars. So uh, one of the very early use cases of 5G as well uh, is connected car, which is freeing up your time so that you can enjoy the world more and more. Now, cars have tons of sensors. So you can see in this uh, image over here that all those sensors are communicating with your servers, with your core technologies, 
and the car is just navigating through any kind of environment on its own. You don't need a driver anymore. Um, so imagine with me for a second, as cars get connected, they become more independent. We don't need to own them anymore. We can just subscribe to a service. So in the world of 2025, just like I used to book my, um, my meetings and my meeting rooms, and just uh, with a click of a button, Zoom link would be added, a click of a button is just required to book the car as well. And it would be just added to your calendar and the car will be just there for you and just in time for you so that you can be at the next place. So in this world, uh, all, the, all the things that we used to do for a car, for example, buying insurance and doing the charging for the car, maintenance, traffic violation tickets, parking, car wash, and everything that the humans used to do are no longer necessary. They're part of the car, car economy. They're, part of, they're, they're the payable for that machine. And on the other side, the receivables for the machine are video streaming, video conferencing, advertising, ride fees, gaming services, AR, VR experiences. These are all uh, the, the, the receivables for a car. So imagine now that the cars have wallets. They can transact. They can, they can communicate to machines. If a car needs charging and it, it is negotiating on a smart grid where it can find the lowest rate of electricity, and let's say Niagara Falls has, uh, is offering the lowest rate at the moment, machines will just negotiate with each other the rate and just, uh, just get that service subscribed. And us humans, we are just paying for this whole thing as a service. We are just subscribing to it and paying for it. Another dimension of machine to machine economy is more and more robots are uh, taking over in terms of manufacturing and automating all those tasks on the assembly line. And again, the same concept of transactions applies here. Now in 2025, robots are being taxed because uh, they were resulting in displacing some of the human jobs, although those human jobs were going into some different functions, but governments decided to tax these robots. So now a robot has a duty and a liability to pay to the government. It, you need to get insurance for it. You need, there's the data that is being generated. All of that is being, there are tons of business models around it. So all the machines are communicating and talking to each other. What this means is the banking of future is completely different. Banking was designed for humans. It was designed for 6 billion, 7 billion people and the transactions that they do. But now in the machine to machine economy, the whole different scale that the banking sector needs to evolve to, and it needs to be ahead of, so it can be part of all these transactions. So exciting, right? Uh, full of possibilities. So let's take a pause and reflect on the present. And why do I say so? It's in near impossible to predict future. No one predicted COVID would be coming and we would be here in 2020. So it's easier to connect the dots uh, looking backwards rather than going forward, right? So before we jump into the next section, uh, I wanna give you one quick uh, interesting thought process. So 2010s was the decade of mobile. Imagine 15 years from, uh, back from today. There were no smartphones, there was no internet, we were not using computing on the go, it was all, uh, different kind of communication, completely different kind of world, which it, it is really hard for you and me to even imagine, right? And if you think about it, how did we live in that world? How would we communicate from one place to another, uh, go from one place to another, find the address, be on time, schedule everything? It's, it's extremely difficult to imagine the world 15 years back. And I can assure you, 10 years from now, we would be looking back at today and we would be seeing mobile and finding how different was that world where we were all in our mobile phones all the time, reading on our screens. We won't talk to the person sitting next to you just during our lunch, during anything. We're just on our screens constantly like zombies, right? So this world would look very, very different to us when we look back on it. And what makes me say that? So like I said, 2010s was the decade of mobile. Mobile was the center of digital. So that was our portal, our gateway to connect with friends, to pay for things, to share things, uh, social experiences, chat, gaming, anything you name it, mobile was the center of the experiences. But going forward, it won't be true. 
So like we saw in the 2020, journey to 2025, uh, the immersive experiences of future will be ambient. You don't need a device anymore. All of these experiences, devices will be seamless, will be around you, will be in the environment. We are moving more and more towards human-centered experiences. So allow me to explain that in, in a few seconds. What I mean by human-centered experience is, as, as a human, it is natural for us to communicate with each other verbally, right? That's, that's a skill that most human beings in the world, barring few, uh, naturally learn. But in terms of interacting with the mobile phone, that's an acquired skill. Kids have to learn it, and there are a lot of people in the world, more than 1.5 billion people in the world who don't even use these mobile phones. So for them, learning this experience is a very big challenge. But what I'm getting to is, this is an acquired skill. Talking is natural. So the experiences of future will be more natural. And we would feel, feel how difficult was it for us to communicate in 2020s and the decade before when all those immersive experiences are so easy and natural for you to use. So what, why, am I, uh, why am I saying this and what makes me for, uh, confident in saying that mobile is dead and the future is immersive? So let's take a look at why do we use mobile phone and let's look around in 2020, how things are uh, shaping up. So what do we use mobile phone for? To give input to machines. So we, talk, we, we, uh, we type, we touch the screen, we provided input with clicks and gestures. So we already know that voice technologies are shaping up very, very fast, very, very quick. So voice is becoming more and more of a very viable alternative of providing input to the machine. We are seeing more and more that the gestures are maturing up. So Facebook, VR, and gaming needed all those sensors in your hands which you would hold to play certain kinds of games. In 2019, Facebook did a quantum leap and they're done away with, with the hand controllers. Now, in VR experiences, we can just use our gestures and the VR experience will take all our inputs from the gestures. So in 2020, this is already out there. Then motion and posture would be another way to give, provide inputs. And Elon Musk is already on a quest to make a brain control interface where you don't have to provide inputs through talking, speaking, typing, texting, you just think about it and the machine knows about it. What else do we use mobile phone for? We use it for giving, getting output. So you can see already how things are shaping up. It used to be that I would call Chris and Chris would pull his phone up and uh, would try to listen in and dial in and, and correspond with me, but not anymore. You would just use your smartphone to take the call and the speakers are in your he earphone. Uh, you, don't, you don't even take the phone out anymore you're seeing more and more of this trend, right? So smart ear pods, voice are naturally taking over your output functions of the phone as well. And then the neural pathways, right? So if you're able to communicate to the machine in terms of input, we can also get an output from the machine and communicate back to our brains uh, what, uh, what, the, what the output of that machine was. And one more thing is haptic control. We will see more and more of haptic based gestures um, and interfaces coming up. One more thing we use mobile phone for is the screen, right? So it's a display format. We will see more and more of Google Lens, Google Glasses, uh, AR, VR, and even smartwatches. They are becoming our, they are already auxiliary screens, secondary screens that we use. But going forward, like we discussed, uh, the screen share from mobile will radically transform. And then the fourth thing, we use mobile phone for computing. It is a really powerful computer in your hand. It can do a lot of processing. Um, so hopefully by end of today's session, you would know why 5G is so important and why it helps us in doing so many, much processing. So cloud computing will take most of that processing load out. Uh, we will learn about edge computing and distributed computing also in today's session. And you will appreciate how computing will be offloaded from mobile and it will result in completely different experiences of future. So let's take a quick pause. We went through a ride of future. Uh, so let's just take two minutes and reflect on how do you want 2025 to be? Uh, so it's just your wish list, your speculation, your future that you're designing for. So quickly jot down your thoughts and send it into the chat.
All right, so let's start the clock and we'll just resume in two minutes. I'm excited to see what we come up with. What's your right. idea? Well, does, What's your yeah, idea use you, case? Well, I just want to be done with this COVID thing and <laughs> to a future where, uh, where it's full of exciting possibilities. And I'm really personally stoked about uh, the immersive experiences that uh, we discussed about, for example, the Facebook experience, right? Uh, the next generation of that evolving experience, I, I am, I'm looking forward to it. How does it shape up? Uh, how does it uh, translate into our lives? Is it just a hype or uh, we will truly care more about immersive experiences? The reason I, I'm interested in it is as we see more and more, Facebook is losing more interest uh, from our generation at least, right? People are finding it to be a distraction. Um, it's, it's a lot of clutter that is coming up. So we are craving towards more and more quality connections. And I'm hoping that these immersive experiences of future, which Facebook is betting a lot more on, uh, will hopefully provide that. What about you, Chris? What do you think? Uh, well, where to begin? I don't think 5G can give me some more hair. Um, but other than that, yeah, I could really go for a coffee right now. But I think that might be asking a little too much, a little too early. Uh, but I'm very happy to report that we are getting some really, really good suggestions uh, in the chat here. So we have uh, somebody would love to, I speak out and book an appointment with the doctor. Uh, we have another person who would uh, not move a finger and get everything done that's running in their head. I think that's a wish of all of ours. Uh, somebody would like their own housekeeper and best friend. I could certainly go for a little less housework. Uh, connected transport system. Uh, a system that recognizes my voice for authentication and can diagnose if I am suffering just from their voice. Ooh, are any of these pop, are any of these popping out at you, is there? Yeah, I'm I'm curious to learn more about this voice assistant thing. So if we could okay, ask so I am going to unmute the wonderful little uh, or the, our wonderful uh, attendee, uh, Juju James. Let's let's talk. Hello. Hello. Hi. Can you hear would me? you like to? Yeah, we can hear you. Uh, would you like to elaborate more on what your what your thought is? Uh, actually, I'm working on a telemedicine platform. Okay, which mm -hmm. uh, of we do a white labeling. So we was I was just uh, wondering last few days. You know, the future is going to be uh, more with voice, and uh, the whole platform uh, needs to be voice enabled. Where, uh, where authentication or even with my voice, if I'm feeling sick, it should, even if I'm having a sore throat, it should recognize and give the diagnosis to my doctor to help them uh, say that I guess is uh, suffering from so and so issues. You know, and then the whole thing has to be voice enabled, is what I'm visualizing. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. And we are seeing it already, right? Uh, so, one of the key startups uh, in healthcare. Uh, they they already use a voice recognition uh, so AI based system in which yeah. you would just as if you were talking to a doctor, so you would just talk to the uh, computer system and it would do a triage. It would ask you right. some basic questions and then kind of di uh, diagnose what kind of bucket do you fall in, and then it hands you over to the doctor. So what you are saying is just 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 a step forward to it, I guess. Yeah, yeah. correct. Okay. Awesome. Uh, thank you for contributing. Any any other participant, if they want to share a quick thought? Um, we've got, how about skin embedded tech? Yeah, that's an interesting one. All right, Usman, you are up, my friend. One moment here, let me unmute you. Uh, do, do, do. Perfect. Hello. Hello, hi. Um, so yeah, so I'm thinking um, uh, because of 5G, uh, we'd have, uh, uh, you know, like uh, more sensors, more silicon based uh, uh, chips embedded in our skin that would uh, that would give the person with the with the embedded tech uh, greater awareness about his own health and, uh, you know, direct communication with uh, healthcare professionals. Very likely, uh, and thank you for bringing it up. I, 
I think this chip thing is is on a lot of people's mind, right? Especially because of COVID, there was a lot of big cons- conspiracy that uh, 5G has probably caused it, right? And there is another conspiracy going on that it's probably an excuse for the vaccine players to embed chips in your bodies to like detect you. A lot of crazy stuff, but uh, then there's some valid use cases actually, which are in discussion. Uh, where people may actually find useful to have embedded chips, and healthcare being one of them. So you very rightly pointed out a very interesting use case. Thank you. Awesome. All right. Okay. So, uh, Chris, with your permission, I'll, I'll proceed to the next section. Absolutely. Thank you so much, everybody who participated. I just want to encourage you that we do have a Q&A session at the end. So, again, please, some of you already have made use of the, of the function, but do so. Okay, yeah, please keep the questions coming in. So in this section, what we'll do is now that we saw what is the potential in terms of experiences, we'll take a little bit deeper dive into the 5G capabilities and see how we will get to 2025 and how those things will work, right? So 5G is on the horizon, like Chris said. Well, 5G in Canada, all the three big carriers have already launched 5G as of last week. And in USA, we are seeing already Verizon went to 5G. It's a race towards uh, expansion at the moment, just like 4G, everyone wants to brag that we are live in X so and so many, uh, so and so many cities. And AT&T has come up with a funny name, and they're already calling themselves this 5G Plus, right? It's it's kind of a marketing gimmick, but uh, that, that's how it is. The companies want to distinguish themselves. Uh, and I want to tell you one interesting thing. So even though 5G is taking time, it will it will take time to gradually take up and shape and form. 4.5G is here. And in Silicon Valley, this is a download speed of 459 megabits per second uh, using a 5G phone, 4.5G enabled phone. It has a lot of new tech in it. And in, in San Francisco, the towers have all those technologies switched in. So even on 4.5G, you can see this speed. This is huge speed. Today's average speeds are 50 megabits per second on broadband, right? Um, so imagine 459. What it does for you is is, is phenomenal. Uh, let's take a quick look at how we are reaching here. So remember, we, we talked about that 15 years back, everything was so different in the world. We were in 2G. The whole connectivity piece was just designed to do voice and SMS. It was a quantum leap. We, we could communicate to each other without using fax machines and other things or fixed lines, right? Big deal. But that was 90s. Uh, 3G really opened up the smartphone era, um, and it enabled us to browse internet through smartphones. It added value to life, and the entire ecosystem of mobile applications it came, started coming shaping up in between 3.5G and 4G. So it's interesting to learn that uh, a lot of these technology ecosystems go hand in hand. So Uber and all these fancy business models of 2020s. Um, sorry, 2010s, did not come along in isolation. In fact, um, Elon Musk and these people were already asking telcos that when is 4G being launched, when is 3G being launched, uh, and our applications need those uh, internet connectivity to have the uh, have our applications, our startups work. Um, so 4G was more about data, faster speeds, videos, and it connected our life. 5G, on the other hand, will just become part of our life. Um, so this section will go into how 5G is, 5G is different from 4G. A lot of people think that 4G is just an increment. It's just a funny marketing gimmick of all these telcos to just add one more G and get more money from us, right? Well, it's, it's, it's not true. 5G is actually a quantum leap. And why do I say so? So remember, we said that in San Francisco, even on 4.5G, we are getting 496 megabits per second. So let's do the math. If we are saying our average speed today is 25 megabits per second, and we are talking 400 Mbps, that's a 16x increment. That means we are saving 41 minutes on downloading an HD movie. We are saving 51 minutes on downloading 1,500 high-definition photos. And then 10 hours on downloading 10, 10 songs. So things are instantaneous. 4G is really strong, powerful in our lives, and 5G is going to be a quantum leap. Then let's understand latency. So as of today, the latency is 50 milliseconds 4G. But in 5G, the latency will be close to 1 millisecond. 
um, we'll, I'll explain that in, in a minute, why that matters. But just keep that for reference that the human response time of us understanding and responding to our environment is 250 milliseconds. Uh, but still 50 millisecond is not good enough for certain applications and we'll learn why. Um, and then bandwidth. So we will see gigabit speeds and gigabit bandwidth in terms of 5G. Think of it as a super highway that is being constructed. More and more devices can connect and then they can transmit huge amounts of data in real time. So it's just a super highway that is being constructed. Data takes time. So let's take a deeper dive at latency, right? So data takes time to reach from one place to another, from uh, reaching your eyes and ears. And what, what are the typical casualties of the latency? Well, your page loading speeds and your experience loading speeds are low. And your remote responses are, are delayed. Video streaming is like you're waiting for it to buffer. And cloud gaming is just not possible in, 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 with, with high latency. So in today's world, our networks adjust to the experiences. So if you are used to playing YouTube, you, have, you know that this feature of auto. So you have two choices practically. If you want to watch it in HD, uh, and if there is some delay, what it will do is it will buffer and you'll see the spinning wheel. Or you just leave it at auto, what it will do is adjust your video experience according to the network. So it's a best effort. Uh, sometimes you'll see amazing quality, other times you'll see just the video is quality is going down as your network speed is, uh, is wavering. But in future, you can get guaranteed 4K experience. Or if you subscribe to 8K experience, you will get 8K experience. No buffering, no downgrade quality. So what this means is, 5G technologies will support your desired user experience instead of adjusting to the experience quality of the network. Uh, so you would just subscribe to, hey, I want this whole thing in 4K, and it supports HD video, 60 FPS frames, the 5.1 surround set settings. It gives you amazing experiences on videos and quality if you subscribe to them. Um, let's understand a little bit on the spectrum. So, so far, uh, there was a limited bandwidth allocated to 4G, 3G, and 2G by all the government regulators. But in 5G, it comes in shapes and forms. So it, it's, it's able to utilize the whole spectrum. So it can, it can work on low frequencies, for example, in rural areas and IoT applications. Um, it can work in high frequencies, which is 3.4 gigahertz and 3.8 gigahertz. This supports urban environments and it can go into millimeter wave, for example. So you can see some of these telcos have already bought some sections of the spectrum and they're enabling 5G early launches in parts of the spectrum. Uh, Canada hasn't even auctioned the millimeter wave. USA has, so Verizon. Uh, Verizon is planning on already launching the uh, millimeter wave, uh, dense urban environment. Why does it matter? So you can see the symbol, right? So the millimeter wave, is a very high bandwidth uh, 5G application. So in case of stadiums, you would see small, small towers. Right now we can see towers on our building, but in 5G millimeter wave, you need hundreds of those towers in a small location because these signals of millimeter wave cannot penetrate walls. They're just as good as within your apartment building or within the indoor experience. So to support them, you need a lot more of those cell towers around you but they will support high uh, bandwidth applications. And then we talk about high frequency. So you can see the purple area covers a lot of ground. So rural applications and IoT applications. One more concept in 5G is network slicing. So what does network slicing mean? Think of network slicing as a high occupancy vehicle lane. So if you are commuting in the morning, used to before COVID, uh, you would probably have preferred to go and hop onto a high occupancy vehicle. So grab a buddy and then make sure that you are on a high occupancy lane so that you're beating the traffic. So think of network slicing as a way that your network and that your application can subscribe to a high bandwidth channel. And it can get a super high way where it will not see the other traffic. It will just have a dedicated lane go through and through. And this dedicated lane will be configured for different kinds of applications. So over here you can see, for example, one of the dedicated lanes that would be enabled will be broadband. Uh, so they will support applications like gaming, like high video content, 8K content. And then there's the machine type 
uh, massive communication types, so smart homes, connected factories. And the third one will be ultra reliable. So any use cases which need minute, um, which need super accuracy in terms of latency, they will subscribe to these slices. And examples would be robots, would be connected cars. Um, so why does latency matter? Again, remind me, right? That's what probably everyone is thinking. So we, we talked about human reaction time is 250 milliseconds, right? And that is enough to cause an accident on, on roads. It's just a blink of an eye. We checked our phone, we looked here and there, our car gets hit and we are into an accident. So 250 second, milliseconds is huge deal for a connected car. Connected car needs immediate responses. That is why one millisecond latency that 5G provides is super critical for these applications. So what you could do is subscribe to any of these super highways, depending on your use case. And each highway supports a different kind of uh, performance. So you can get gigabit speed or latency, or if you're an IoT device, you would just subscribe to uh, the second layer, right? So what this does is if your application, for example, IoT application, uh, which is like a garbage disposal truck, uh, dump in a city, for example. It has an IoT device, and all it has to send to the government is, I'm full, I'm empty, every half hour. It does not need a lot of bandwidth. It does not need super critical speed. It just needs connectivity. So, and, and over here, what matters is battery life, because the sensors in it should be operating for 10 years, for example, right? So 5G covers a lot of ground. It's designed not only to connect humans and phones, it's designed to connect cities, sensors, and a lot more kind of different applications. So we covered so far bandwidth, latency, network slicing, and then the last use case I wanna cover with you is edge computing. This is first time ever that we will get it on the telco networks. <clears throat> so let's understand what edge computing means. So all our devices are on one end, right? Our connected uh, glasses, our cameras, let's say our watches, uh, and then we have a customer edge. So for example, in a home, we connect it to a router. So the router is the edge of the network. Um, in terms of telecom, it's probably like a tower, right? So these edges are typically within five kilometer range. And what it does is if the edge is five kilometers, the latency to this point is 10 milliseconds. Now let's talk about the network edge. So this is where the network begins. Um, so in case of cell towers, it's the cell towers. In case of fixed line, it's the cabinet. So the, the cabinet of the uh, fiber optic cable on the, on the street end is your start of the network. Uh, then if you have network aggregation points, you can see that as we are moving away from it, the distance of that point is increasing and the latency is, in, is, is also increasing. So let's say I press a button here on my phone, that gesture, goes from my network edge to the aggregation point, to the telco core, all the way to the Amazon web servers or the Google servers at the back end. And then it processes it and, and then I get a response back into my application that, okay, this touch meant that this and display this screen to the user. So in, in doing so, this round trip is going through thousand kilometer or more. And this is the cause of latency of hundred millisecond or more. In case of edge computing, imagine that the computing of the cloud power that is sitting at the back end on the extreme right side is being moved closer to you. Imagine that you get a cloud server on your router. Imagine that you get it on the telco tower. So that is edge computing. So you can subscribe to these edge computing and it allows you to uh, do processing closer to you. So uh, let me unpack that for you in, in case of connected car, right? Um, so imagine there's a congestion and one car is trying to tell the other cars to slow down. Um, so it cannot wait a long time. Um, another analogy I often use to explain this is, for example, uh, a hot coffee mug, right? So if it's too hot, I just touch it and my body processes it and immediately knee jerk reaction is my hand is out of it. Till the time my brain processes it and figures it out, it's too late but my central nervous system and my backbone already processed and, and told my body and my hand to withdraw from it because this is danger. So the processing happened in my spinal cord, not in my brain. Um, in the same case, the signal from the car will just go to the telco tower, telco tower will process it and tell the other car, hey, I don't know what's wrong, other car is stopping, 
put down the brakes. And by this time, the signal has traveled to the cloud and the whole network now knows what is the problem and what should be the appropriate response. But this process, local processing helps you save a life and helps you enable the use case of connected cars. So this is not only a telco thing, right? Uh, Amazon is already preparing for the edge of the network, at least in fixed networks. We will see Amazon uh, partnering with telcos or competing with them in future. Google is preparing for edge computing devices and edge computing power. Uh, Microsoft is also placing its bet, bet on edge computing. So now we learned the core foundation of 5G, uh, bandwidth, latency, um, network slicing, and then edge computing. Let's tie it back to experience design and product design. How will it empower these experiences? So when I said edge computing is the first time ever that we are seeing this, what I mean is the last mile of user experience. So let me explain that with an analogy. So imagine that you are a restaurant owner. You have amazing experience that you have created. You have perfect ambiance. You have paid so much attention to detail to even the ingredients. But your food is being ordered uh, to your home now because of COVID and you're dependent on third parties to deliver it. So the last mile delivery was not in your control. It was being supplied by a third party. And by the time the food reaches your home, the customer just forgets the whole experience that you have curated in terms of producing that food, but the last experience was, experience was bad. So experience is something we take away as the aggregate of everything. If you went to a place, you had a great time, you cannot put your finger on what was great. Was the food great, ambience great, it was the friends, it was the company, no, the whole thing was great or the whole thing was bad. So one, one thing is it defines your overall emerging experience. So in terms of user experience, we see a lot of these uh, layers of experience. So at first, top end, we have user behavior, then we have interfaces, so mobile phones and all these interfaces that we are talking about, then there's interaction design, then there's the integration with the back end, and then there's the network. So all the experience has to be delivered to you over the network. And then it goes to your device and it's served to you over the device. So first time ever experienced designers will get control over the network part. They will be able to work with the telcos to modify this part so that the experience is guaranteed to you. Remember the YouTube example we saw? So there they can Netflix can now guarantee you 8K experience or 4K experience that you will subscribe going forward. What it will do for uh, future of experience is it will drive a lot of user behavior. Users will see that in one place and they would want it across the board in all their applications. And then we will see more and more of um, emergence of interface interaction and future integration design uh, going forward. So. I don't know how many people are familiar with cloud computing here, but if you are familiar, so cloud computing is something that as an application designer, you would go to your dashboard. This is how it will work in 5G in future. So you are a connected car owner. So you go and you subscribe to a network slice. You pick that my caravan cars are the top sellers and I wanna give premium service to them. And in terms of like, for example, around Toronto and GTA region, I want them uh, to get premium experience. So enable network slicing for me in this region from this time to that time, for example. Or if you want to uh, avoid rush times and get uh, an, an ER VR experience, for example, and rush time is suffering, you could subscribe to a telco edge computing for you. So you could enable that all these towers that we are I'm seeing problems, I wanna enable the edge computing for them at a specific date, time, or a trigger event and enable uh, this end-to-end -end experience for my customers. So how does it transform gaming? Um, so we talked about computing power, right? So if the edge computing is moving closer to your edge, your device does not need that much computing. So your computing can be done into the network or on the edge. Your battery power will be saved because now you don't need that much strong processor or display. Uh, and then your latency is already taken care of 5G. So the future of gaming is immersive. Um, gaming is one of the early use cases of 5G. And what we have seen is that right now people are using eight gigabits of data per month. But because of gaming in 2025, we will see 200 gigabits of data being consumed by consumers. And uh, this quote is my favorite, like 4G put a DVD player in your pocket. 
So we subscribe to uh, on-demand video experiences. What 5G is going to do is put a PlayStation in your pocket. So we are already seeing um, the, the rise of Google Stadia, for example, where you don't need a hardware device. You can just connect through your phone and you can uh, subscribe to the first person shooter games or real time games in that. Similarly, mixed reality, we'll see a lot of bandwidth being unlocked, latency problem. So remember we talked about milliseconds latency. So in VR, one of the core problems is um, that if you tilt your head and the screen you're seeing on the, on the screen does not adjust uh, naturally for us, as if it, we were looking at what we are seeing in the natural environment, we get dizziness. Uh, so a delay up to 10 milliseconds in VR can cause severe headache for you. So that is why 5G is going to be enabling technology for mixed reality and these experiences going forward. What it would do is because of cloud computing, it would take the cloud computing from, from this whole box that you're putting on your headset. You don't need that box anymore because cloud computing will take the computing away. Battery will be no longer needed. So the form factor of these devices will completely transform. So I'm, I'm gonna skip over some of the slides so that I can get you to question and answer. Similarly, video surveillance is another powerful use case. We will see a lot of the edge detection and the video surveillance and tracking uh, being taken care of by the edge computing and local processing. So it will enable a lot more of video surveillance and drone-based surveillance use cases in future as well. So key takeaway for the developers, so what, what we were talking about, remember California, 4.5G, we are still able to get 450 megabits per second. So imagine that your phone, once it, re it reads stuff from your um, SD card, the speed for reading is 250 milli megabits per second. But if you're getting 400 megabits per second download speed, why should I store my information in my SD card? I can just put it into cloud and then I don't need that much storage in my phone. And what it also means is the applications will go cloud-based. We don't need to install them anymore. The app should not live on your phone. It can live into the cloud. We just click a button and it's just instantly loaded. What this means is we don't need that much storage. We don't need that much computing power and our phone will become very different. And the APIs of future, that also means your application will become dependent on other applications. Uh, and already we are seeing that that experience in the latest launch of um, by Apple, right? So they're call, calling it applets. So that's the new new way forward that your apps will be mini apps which will be embedded into each other. And take away for experience designers, so the future of computing is radically different from today. Remember that that's where we started off. So why is it so? What do we use phone for? Display, memory, battery input and output, right? So we have screenless displays coming. We have cloud computing and 5G computing that will take away the need for memory and processing. And then we have battery, more and more technology advancements are coming in terms of battery. And then input and output. Remember we talked about, we have viable interfaces that are coming in. So the future of tomorrow is not mobile, it's ambient computing. So with that, that concludes our presentation. Now the floor is open for question and answers. Thank you very much, Uzair. That was wonderful. And the questions are certainly flooding in. Uh, we will start off with in no particular order. Um, I'm working as a UX UI designer. Curious to hear what the possibilities of how design will shift when it is screenless. Yeah, so um, there's no straight answer to it. Uh, one of the concepts we explored was uh, spatial computing, right? So just like we saw in the, in the spatial computing experiences, we, we will see the beginning of 3D applications. So we will see more and more interfaces which are 3D. Um, and uh, we already see them, by the way, in gaming applications, right? But in just, let's say, mobile application or web application, we don't see that many of 3D experiences. It's mostly 2D. You just scroll a page. But going forward, you will see more and more integration of 3D uh, concept into even mobile app and even into, uh, into the web application. So that's certainly one of them. Um, and then second part or the main core concept we explored today was ambient computing, right? So today, our interface mostly is web and mobile. 
but going forward, we will see more and more of interfaces. So as a, as a user, uh, how do we ensure, uh, as a designer, how do we ensure that the experience that they're uh, having with our digital product or service is seamless across so many different interfaces? So more and more interfaces will come into the picture. Um, and then uh, I would say that the other concepts of cloud computing um, and the network part is more related to product designers uh, in terms of how they can optimize their experience delivery to uh, for the end consumers. Amazing. Okay, up next, what is the impact of 5G on user privacy and security threats? Yeah, that, that, that is a very uh, wider topic, I would say. Um, as more and more data gets collected, for sure, 5G means more speed, more data collection, more processing power, right? So there, there will for sure be more and more privacy concerns. Uh, one um, interesting, I would say, dimension to it is that the regulators are playing catch up, right? So 5G concepts are already launching, but in terms of data privacy, a lot of discussions are still in very, very early stages. Um, and, and there's a big debate going on in terms of big tech in US already, um, whether all these companies doing so much business in different verticals like healthcare, e-commerce, digital lifestyles, whether it's, it's right for them or not. It's, it, I would say it's, a, it's an ongoing uh, topic of debate and discussion. There's no single answer to it. Okay. Um... This next one, it's, uh, while I do think we've covered quite a few of these uh, really great use cases, I'm gonna ask this one anyways, because I'm very curious to hear your answer. Uh, which use case would justify a huge CAPEX investment in the 5G network? Um, so it's, it's a bit, bit difficult to see and predict future, but one of, the, one of the biggest use cases, early adoption use cases are AR, VR, and connected cars. Uh, that's what uh, that's what the device manufacturers are placing their bets on. So you can see there are a lot of publications by Nokia, by Huawei, and by Ericsson around connected car and um, AR VR experiences. Video is I'm not saying that video is not a big use case. Video is already a very big use case in 4G. So it will just continue to exponentially increase. But the new use cases would be around AR, VR, and uh, connected cars would be the early adoption use cases. Okay, awesome. Uh, up next, we have, uh, is ambient computing really any different than IoT? Um, so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a link concept. So all these devices connected to you, to words in your ambience is essentially connected devices, right? What ambient computing uh, is doing is when you bring in the interfaces, then that's what we mean by ambient computing and ambient interfaces. So computing being in your ambience uh, was there from even before, but now what it would do is being ambient, it is also using, making sure that your ambient, ambient uh, I would say space is being used for, for displays and for experiences. I thought it was impressive. I had two Google Homes. Um, okay, so with the advent of next, we've got with the advent of 5G and machines interacting with each other, would we move towards designing, we would, move, would we move towards designing, keeping machine interactions and experiences in mind? Uh, so, of course, um, machine interactions do not particularly need an interface. Right, so that a lot of stuff would be actually happening in the background. Uh, we will see more and more uh, use of AI, for example. Uh, we will see more and more uh, use of, uh, so we talked about IoT, right? So a lot of these things will be in background. What we will see is how would, uh, how would we, us as humans define the rules for it? How would we define that, uh, for example, my connected car, uh, where should it get power from? So if I define like it should get power from this time window to that time window, or these are my preferences. So the controls of these things would be more into interfaces. Um, and similarly, uh, I would say going in, in terms of the network part, uh, as an experience designer, we would have to consider all these uh, things available to us in 5G and, and designer experiences in mind. 
So the applications of future, for example, if they are more and more cloud-based, then they certainly have implications for the experience designers. Okay. Um, up next we have, does it make sense to put the control info in the cloud? Uh, this is a mistake by design itself. So my question is how edge computing will really help the end user. If you could share another example here, that would be great. Um, so if I understand correctly, the, the main question is how edge computing will help the users, right? Uh, yes. Uh, yes. Okay. So edge computing is really doing the processing from the, remember we had the image which explained the back end that if, I, if I'm interacting with the machine, uh, the whole response is going to the back end, to the cloud processing. Uh, and the cloud center could be in Antarctica, right? Very well, it might have to travel hundreds of thousands of kilometers to get the processing power. But if the processing is mover cl moving closer and closer to the user, that just means that the delay that we saw in terms of network going back and forth is no longer needed. Um, another example I will give you is video surveillance. So imagine that in video surveillance, the processing is then done in the cloud. What you have to do is you have to send the entire video feed over the network. So if your video feed was uh, 4K experience, you're using a lot of bandwidth to transport it from the device to the cloud and then get a response back. But if the computing is happening closer to the device, you, you can do the computing, you can detect the images from it, um, and now you don't need to transmit the whole uh, 4K video to the cloud. All you need to communicate to the cloud is this object was detected and this object moved from here to here. And what should I do, for example, in terms of what, what should the response be to the user? So we are saving a lot of bandwidth. We are saving a lot of uh, response time and we are making all these applications much more responsive. And remember one example we shared was VR, that if you use a VR, Experience and it has a delay of more than 10 milliseconds, it will cause you a lot of headache. So this, this edge computing is going to enable a lot of these applications and use cases where latency is super, super critical. Okay, great. Um, up next, oh, this one is actually very interesting. Uh, will 5G make thousands of universities uh, redundant? with top universities covering with their reach through 5G courses uh, and EDX with huge band. Essentially the question is, will 5G make universities and teachers? I, I, I personally feel that that's not dependent on 5G. Uh, universities are already able to, uh, to impart learning experiences at scale, even on 4G, right? So, um, you know, the future of university is a separate topic by itself. And because of COVID, we are seeing a lot and a lot of disruption in that sector, a lot of new business models, a lot of new, uh, I would say, learning experiences coming in. I don't think 5G alone will just change this business model. It, it would have to be a lot of combination of things. Okay. All right, up next we have, uh, how is 5G different than Wi-Fi and would 5G ultimately replace Wi-Fi? Uh, great question. So one of the, um, you, you had earlier asked me what would be the early use cases, right? So one of the early use cases of 5G is, um, is fixed wireless access. So most of the things we covered today was if you're mobile, if you're outside home, right? So that's, that's what we call mobility use case. But one of the major use cases is fixed wireless access. What this means is that you are using it at a static location. You're using it at your office or you're using it at your home. So the millimeter 5G that we talked about uh, is, is, a, is a use case for fixed wireless access. So imagine if you're getting gigabit speed, why do you need your router, right? If you go and change an apartment, uh, you need to call in people who need to install it, you need to install router, you need to configure it. Whereas Verizon 5G is just a device that you just stick on your window and your entire home is connected. You can just take it with you wherever you want and you own your Wi-Fi now. Uh, you don't need to install it. So uh, we are seeing interesting dynamic shift in the market. Uh, it would probably not be right to say that all 5G has the potential to disrupt Wi-Fi. Uh, again, a lot of different factors have to come into play, but it's certainly a contender. Uh, in many places, uh, we will see that people will choose just 
just strictly directly go to 5G kind of device rather than a Wi-Fi kind of experience. Okay, great. Uh, we, we think we're going to have more questions than time here, but that's okay. Uh, up next, we've got, would the user journey still be an important criteria while designing with 5G? As the user is just inputting his or her preferences and the whole journey is happening on the back end and they are just seeing the end results. So I think the user journey is still a great tool, right? Um, in terms of omni-channel experience, so your user journey started on mobile phone, for example, right? But now you flipped on and you did a gesture and the experience is now in, in, in your ambience, right? Mm. So it moved from one device to another, for example. So how does the journey shift from one device to another? Do we pass on all the context from one to another? Uh, so that's the concept called omni, omni experience, right? Omni channel. So if you switch from one channel to another channel, the context should not be launched. The user journey still will continue to be relevant for sure. Uh, they will become more and more complex, I would say, um, because right now we are mapping out journeys in, in one particular channel, one particular device. So we, how often do we design for experiences where we have to shift from mobile to, let's say, a VR experience? That's not yet there, uh, but we will see it more and more uh, going forward. Okay, perfect. And then finally, we have, uh, I think this will be the last question. How do you imagine 6G? Um, so it's, this is far in the future, um, but we can see some news articles are already claiming that China has already started it's uh, R&D on 6G. Uh, these technologies take a lot of time to do R&D and bring them to market. 5G has been in work for uh, more than a decade now, uh, and it will take its form and shape. Like we discussed that by 2025, we will see 30% of the smart connect home, smartphones on 5G in North America markets and Europe and China. So that's still 30%, not 70%, right? So these technologies do take their time. Uh, I would say, uh, at least this decade, we are good for 5G, and most probably we will encounter certain use cases where 5G is no more viable, and we need to go to 6G. Uh, only time will tell. Okay, wonderful. Okay, I might have lied. We we actually might have time for one more very 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 quick question. All right. <laughs> uh, here we go. Um, do do do. Uh, oh, sorry, my, my mistake. Uh, for organizations to maximize how they can utilize 5G, what type of job titles should they have in their roster? Huh, um, I haven't thought about it, but um, I think we are seeing more and more integration of technology and experience. So if I were to predict the product manager role, has to evolve really quickly and really fast. Uh, they need to be aware of all the possibilities and these form factors of these technologies that are coming in and at the same time be aware of the experience layer of it. Um, for sure, we will see more and more job titles coming up in terms of experience design. So you can always, already see in terms of gaming companies, uh, they don't have simple titles of like the UI designer or uh, UX designer, right? They, they, they have a full spectrum of uh, titles and 3D designer, 3D, 3D illustrator, a uh, bunch of other stuff. So we, we will see a lot more specialty in user experience. We will see also a lot of specialty in terms of development roles and tech, and tech lead roles. Um, there certainly will be a lot more role to play by the cloud uh, application designers uh, and developers as well. So. Uh, it's, it, I cannot pinpoint on the titles, but we will see more and more of them evolve as our experiences evolve. Okay, perfect. All right, well, now that actually does do it for all the time that we do have today. Um, thank you, everybody, for taking the time to join us. We hope everybody enjoyed it. Uh, when it's ready, as per usual, we will send out a recording of this presentation to all those who attended, along with the presentation that Uzair gave. Uh, keep an eye out on your inboxes. We will let everybody know about any upcoming events that we have, as well as we'd like to promote them across all of our socials. So once again, thank you all for joining us, and we hope to see you next time. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you.